Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me here. It's a real pleasure to be here um, and um, also to talk to you about the progress we've been making in um, spin-based um, qubits in semiconductors. So this will be the topic of my talk. Um, and uh, so what we're doing in my group at the University of Constance is we are working out uh, some of the theory fundament fundamentals of solid state um, quantum information systems, and among them, and for the most part, um, spins in semiconductors, but also superconducting systems. So this will also tie a little bit into the previous talk. And so actually I will connect directly to what um, Stefan was uh, talking, talking to you about uh, before. So we have these uh, great systems, the superconducting qubits, and so they're definitely among the front runners for the implementation of uh, quantum hardware. And uh, I, I guess you've even seen this picture before. So this is one of the chips. This is not the newest one from Google. Um, it seems also that the IT companies seem to like superconducting hardware. And there are these recent also um, achievements towards quantum error correction. So what, what this uh, contains here is 50, around 50 functioning qubits. And this is sort of the state of the art. I would say that you have around 50 good qubits on a chip. And then um, in particular, this uh, experiment here I was showing uh, this uh, so-called quantum supremacy, also known as quantum advantage, where uh, some computation was done that is not possible uh, on a classical uh, computer. <coughs> um, and the gate fidelity, so the probability that a single elementary logic operation is successful um, is on these systems is, is exceeding 99% now. Um, and yeah, as I said, they make progress towards quantum error correction. So that's all really fantastic, and we are also working on superconducting hardware, but um, there is a, a little thing that should make you uh, think, uh, which is that this is a, a chip which is about one centimeter times one centimeter big, and it contains 50 bits. Uh, so that's not too much, right? So one, one bit is about, um, well, it's about half a millimeter large. So that's fairly large. So that's one challenge, I would say. Um, and uh, so this, this could make you think that, you know, what you have in your pocket uh, with your iPhone or with your, com with your, uh, with your cell phone, uh, this is quite different, right? This is based, well, first of all, it's, it has about 10 billion bits or transistors. So it's uh, vastly more scaled um, and it's semiconductor based, so it's not, su it's not a superconductor, of obviously. Uh, so it's based on silicon and uh, the gate fidelities, I mean, I don't even know the number. It's that there, I think that the companies don't really publish them. I think they must be extremely close to 100% because otherwise you couldn't do what you're doing um, on, on classical hardware. Um, and so wh what this means that you have so many elementary units on such a small area is that these bits are much smaller, right? So they're many orders of magnitude smaller, the pitch of uh, Modern transistors are a few nanometers. And so the qu one question you could ask is, you know, could we also do this qu on the quantum level? And of course, that's, that's a huge, uh, that's very ambitious. But, but I think in some sense what I'm talking about is what, what is the state of the art of doing something like this on the quantum level, so use, using semiconductors. And in basically, this is a representative of the state of the art. So this is from, actually, this is from Quantum Delta. So this is from TU Delft. Uh, this is a, an experiment, uh, a recent experiment from the group of Lieven van der Seypen at TU Delft that, in, uh, that has six qubits, six functioning spin qubits uh, in silicon. Uh, it's in a silicon, silicon germanium heterostructure. And it's, uh, it's, this is a colored um, micrograph. Um, and you see, it, so this, there are not so many qubits, right? So we're not at the point where the superconducting hardware is, uh, obviously. Um, it's all made in silicon and silicon germanium in this case. Uh, the gate fidelities are also exceeding 99%. So in the last few years, in this respect, the semiconductor hardware has caught up with superconductors. Um, and the qubits are quite small. I mean, they're not as small as the transistors on a, on a, on a, on a classical CPU, but they are they're on the sort of sub-micron uh, scale. And so just maybe to point out a bit uh, further the difference between superconducting and semiconducting hardware, we've just heard about um, uh, superconducting qubits. So basically they're based on this 
quantum state of an electric circuit, imagine an LC circuit, and basically the magnetic flux acts a bit like the position of a harmonic oscillator, so you have basically these quantized harmonic oscillator states, um, and then uh, what, uh, what these uh, superconducting qubits are using is that you have a, a, a very nice nonlinear element, the Josephson junction, that makes this nonlinear, and so it allows you to so separate out one of the um, um, transition frequencies, and you basically use these two states as your qubit, so basically you're, you're engineering a qubit out of a many state system, and we've heard about coherences. I think the qubits that uh, you guys have in Munich are even better than this, so they're uh, extremely coherent. Um, and um, so, so basically what uh, the semiconductor people are doing is something slightly different. You can, of course, also get directly get a, a, a two-level system if you have a system that already has two levels, and one, uh, one example is the spin of elementary particles. And so, for instance, if you're able to use the spin of electrons in semiconductors, and we're, we're using quantum dots to confine them in a, into a, a finite area of space, then you already have a two-level system that is, in principle, insensitive against charge noise. That's uh, in principle. And you can use a magnetic field to split up the levels. So this, and you can also use the magnetic fields, and I will also show you how you can use electric fields to access these, uh, these systems. So that's going to be the topic of my talk. So just for those of you who have not heard about this, um, uh, about this uh, type of device. Here's uh, um, basically the idea. So uh, for the most part, what, what one is using is a, it's a 2D system where you have uh, electrostatic gates. So you have a 2D electron system. You have electrostatic gates that can be controlled and under, underneath which you can deplete the, the 2D gas. I mean, nowadays, there are also multi-layer gate structures where you first uh, uh, accumulate uh, electrons and then deplete, uh, uh, further deplete them. Ultimately, what you want to achieve is just these quantum dots, just a kind of a, a, um, an array of quantum dots, could be 1D or 2D in the future, uh, where you have single electrons sitting in, in, these, in these potential wells, and you can controllably couple them using these intermediate uh, uh, gates here. And uh, okay, the spin, of course, is what we are using to encode our qubit. Spin up is zero, spin down is one. And then as a theorist, of course, you're trying to build a model of, of this system, and um, um, this, uh, one of the simplest models is that you're modeling the exchange coupling that, um, that results from virtual hopping of these electrons uh, uh, been, uh, between uh, adjacent dots. You model this with an, a Heisenberg exchange uh, term um, between neighboring uh, spins. And this, as we know already for a long time, this can lead to uh, universal entangling two-qubit gates, like uh, square root of swap, or C naught, if you want. And the state of the art, and this is fairly new, uh, uh, is that these uh, operations can now be done with fidelities exceeding 99.5%. Uh, so they're becoming quite high fidelity. And I will show you some of the tricks that uh, we've been playing to get there. And then there's this uh, other part that you need for computation, which is you need to be able to control single qubits. So this exchange is typically not enough. So you need uh, some, some sort of single qubit gate. And this you will get by addressing a single spin qubit, uh, typically by a local magnetic field. So you need some kind of local Zeeman effect. It's not so trivial. Um, and I will also talk a bit about this. And so this will then allow you to do a one qubit gates. And the state of the art here is that they can be done with three nines. And this is also fairly recent. Um, and in principle, if you have both of these, you can build uh, your universal uh, quantum computer. Um, and of actually, what you also need is good readout. And so that's actually also very new. So you see, this is not, it's not so long ago that um, one has been able to do this uh, high fidelity readout. OK, so what, what I want to talk to you about in the rest of the talk is a little bit about uh, tell you the story how we got there. You know, what were the problems that one had to overcome to actually make these uh, small quantum processors, and then also what we need to do to scale up and so on, what, what are the problems ahead. So one of the problems was materials. Um, and so we realized actually quite early on st uh, that although you, if you can fill in these single electrons into quantum dots, I mean, that's, that's an achievement by on its own. But um, even if you can do this, the problem is that these spins are not technically speaking, not really alone. There are other spins around uh, that come from this, the solid state lattice, from the uh, atoms in the, in the solid. 
depending on which material you use. And people have been using gallium arsenide in the, in the beginning because it's a very pure, uh, very well controlled semiconductor. But the problem is in gallium arsenide, all the atoms have nuclear spins. And so that's terrible. You have lots of, you have a million nuclear spins roughly surrounding a single electron spin. They're all weakly coupled by hyperfine coupling, but you know, this is a mess. This creates uh, very short uh, coherence times. Um, and that was a, a really a big problem. And one of the big bre breakthroughs was to start using other materials. That sounds obvious, but it's not, it's, not, it's not so easy. So people now use silicon, also germanium. And in principle, carbon would be also an interesting low nuclear spin density uh, material. And in, in these systems, let's say, for instance, in silicon, you have 95% of the naturally occurring um, atoms are silicon 28. That they, they have no, si no s nuclear spin. And the remaining nuclear spins, if they still bother you, you can get rid of them. You can just do isotopic purification. And that's what some people are doing to increase uh, the qubit coherence. So here's a little story that I got from, from Leven. Uh, um, so in gallium arsenide, we had T2 star. So these are Ramsey coherence times of about 10 nanoseconds. That's not very long. And then in silicon, you immediately get two orders of magnitude longer coherence times. Um, in, this is in natural silicon. And then if you purify, more, then you get another two orders of magnitude. And now we're in business, right? We have 100 microseconds coherence times. So that's very good. And then some people put back some single nuclear spins, to, uh, and they also have very long coherence times. So that's, that's a different uh, business here. So that's one issue, materials. Another problem is control. Uh, I mean, I, I just told you, OK, you just have to rotate a single spin, but that's not so easy. How do you do that? So in, if you do electric, electron spin resonance, that's, a, uh, that's an established technique, but there you usually have a macroscopic uh, sample. You have at least 10 to the 10 spins uh, for ESR uh, to get a signal and to, to rotate the spins. We're using an, uh, an oscillatory magnetic field. So how do you do it with one spin? This can be done. So this was also done in the Netherlands in, uh, by Frank Coppens et al. in uh, 20, 2006. ESR with one single electron spin. And you cannot measure the magnetic signal that comes from this, but you can measure this by looking at a Pauli blocking. So you have another spin which has the same, is the same spin, and so the, the, the first spin cannot hop onto the second dot because of the Pauli uh, exclusion principle, but then if you rotate one of the spins, you suddenly get a, a movement of a charge, and this you can measure on the one electron level. But this is really hard. I mean, you have to make uh, an antenna on top of this, and it's very hard to access only one of the spins. Basically, you, you will rotate all the spins in your register if you do this. So this is hard. Uh, what would be much easier is local electric fields, because that's what chips are made for, right? You have wires that go out that connect to only one gate, and you can also put an AC voltage, obviously, and so that's what one can do easily. But the problem is, of course, the electron spin doesn't directly react to an oscillatory electric field. That's the whole point of spin qubits that they're not coupled to electric fields that makes them so coherent. So then you need to also engineer this, and then uh, there are different uh, ways you can do it. One is spin orbit coupling. I mean, the spin does weakly react uh, to electric fields. Um, and this can be used to do electric dipole spin resonance. And this was also done in, 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 in Delft uh, first. And it can, this is in gallium arsenide still, where the spin orbit coupling is fairly large. This is in silicon, and there it's also a bit hard because in silicon, spin-orbit coupling is not very large. Silicon is a fairly light element, and the spin-orbit coupling is fairly weak. So another idea, another trick that we're using currently is to use synthetic, what I call synthetic spin-orbit coupling. So you put a little magnet on top of your chip. It creates a fringe field which is inhomogeneous. If an electron moves in an inhomogeneous magnetic field, it's as if it sees an oscillating or a, a, a time-dependent um, magnetic field. So if you periodically shake the electron using a, an oscillatory electric field, it will effectively see an oscillatory magnetic field, and the spin will rotate. And so this is what we're using currently. This is the workhorse of current experiments. This is what led to this 99.9 uh, single qubit gate fidelity. You can also use germanium rather than silicon, and uh, because germanium is one row lower in the periodic table than silicon, it's heavier, it has larger spin-orbit coupling, and there you can use uh, spin-orbit coupling. And you can use holes instead of electrons. That's another way of uh, operating. Okay, so actually another nice trick is this so-called flopping mode spin qubit that we developed together with Princeton University, the group of Jason Petter. The idea is just to use a double quantum dot, you put one electron inside, 
Now the electron can move from left to right. It's, uh, it sees a, a large magnetic field gradient, and you can control its electric dipole. Either you detune the dot, and the electron is still, or you symmetrize the dot, and the electron goes back and forth, and it couples to the electric field. So this works both for cavity QED and, and for electron spin uh, resonance. OK, then finally, high fidelity gates. So here's basically the first uh, universal um, quantum processor based on spin qubits. It has two qubits. <laughs> that's, that's really the minimum. Um, so it has two spins, two quantum dots, and two quantum dots. It coup they're coupled by exchange. They have an, uh, a magnetic field gradient turned on. And you have different components of the gradient actually distinguish the resonance frequencies of these two spins for EDSR. Uh, and then also another gradient uh, allows you to uh, basically shake the electron, as I just explained, in order to get EDSR. And then you have uh, gates here that control the single spin operations and also the coupling between the spins. And here's, uh, you actually, there are two ways to operate. Here's how it works. Um, you can do either DC control to make a C phase gate. And the idea is simply that if you have two spins, you have these four levels in an external field, the parallel spin states split off. And if you have a field gradient, the anti-parallel spin states also are also split. And uh, if you now, as a function of time, you apply an exchange coupling, you switch an, on an exchange coupling for a finite amount of time, then it turns out that these anti-parallel spin states will, uh, will be lowered in energy, and so they acquire a phase. And this is exactly what you need for the C-phase gate. So that's one way of doing a C-phase gate. Another way, and that's how uh, many people do it nowadays, is to do AC control, you, do ba you basically do the same thing, but you also apply a resonant pulse here between these two uh, states, the uh, down-up and the up-up state. And so this means you rotate the second spin only if the first spin is, um, sorry, you rotate the first spin only if the second spin is up. Because this down here, if the second spin was down, would have another frequency. And this is because of the coupling. And this gives you directly a C0 gate. And so this is the, uh, this, this is the theory. This is just the probability of the target spin to be uh, rotated as a function of time. And then this is the experiment from the PETA group. Uh, at the time, they were at Princeton. Now they're at UCLA. And from this, you see, well, at the time, the readout fidelity was really crappy. It was less than 80%. This has been improved tremendously in the meantime. And the gate times are on the order of 130 nanoseconds. Actually, there was one uh, little problem that I want you to tell you that led to a further improvement of fidelity. And this is, if you do this kind of resonant gate, so you're driving one of those resonances with a, with a microwave tone, of course, you're driving all the transitions all the time. Uh, of course, it's just the other. And so what, so what you want to do is here that this is the target spin here. Ideally, you would flip it, let's say, from up to down, or from 0 to 1, with this resonant transition. But the problem is that you're, of course, although this is off resonant, you're, of course, still driving it off resonantly. And it's not rotating much, but the target spin is still rotating a little bit. And so it's, it's doing this. If the control is 0 and you want to do a C0, you want this to, be, you want this to do nothing. But actually, it does something um, off resonantly up here. And it doesn't even complete the circle. And what you can do is you can make sure that at least this completes the circle once or n times. This is what we call synchronization. And this requires a, a, ra a specific ratio between the coupling strength and the drive strength. And this is just the formula you get. So it depends on the magnetic field gradient, which tells you how far off resonant you are here. And so basically, here is a, a formula that tells you you can choose any integer numbers, n and m. And for these integer numbers, if you choose that, then you will close the circle here. Your gate will be synchronized. You will have a, a nice uh, C0 gate. And this will further increase the fidelity of your gate. And actually, this was used. Uh, last year, there was a paper by the group of Seiko Tarucha at uh, Rikin in Tokyo. And uh, they reported uh, very high fidelity gates, exceeding 99% um, two qubit gate fidelity. And if you look closely, you know, they, they have a Rabi frequency. They have an exchange coupling. They change them to maximize their fidelity. But the ratio between the two is always the same. It's, square root of 15. And so if you read the paper, you think, well, why square root of 15? But then you have to go back and read our paper. And it's 15 is square root of 15 is just one case of this synchronization condition. So they're actually doing this. Um, just to uh, be complete here, um, 
There are also people who use the DC gate, for instance, the, in the group, uh, in the D Delft group, they're using DC gates to make equally high fidelity two qubit gates. And you see these two groups also start making some small applications, but these are really few qubits. So this is not really uh, useful yet, but these are just demonstrations. All right, so, so okay, so maybe just to, to kind of summarize that the um, development in two qubit fidelity for uh, semiconductor spin qubits, here's a little chart. So this is a logarithmic plot of one minus the fidelity, to be, to be precise, and this is uh, time. And so this was five years ago when uh, we did the first uh, this first universal quantum processor, this is this, is this red thing here, with, uh, this is the PETA group at Princeton, this was uh, another experiment with a very similar technique at uh, TU Delft. And then a few years later there was an experiment from a group in, uh, at UNSW in Sydney, and then there were these high fidelity gates uh, last year by uh, Tokyo and Delft. Uh, there was another experiment by PETA at uh, Princeton still, which uh, slightly exceeded that. Uh, there's another type of spin qubit, which is called the exchange-only qubit. That's an encoded spin qubit that can work only with exchange. And they, those fidelities are also approaching 99%. And so if, you're a, if, you, if you see this, and if you're a theorist, and you don't care about how hard it is to do this, then you could just think, well, okay, I'm just uh, pull uh, Gordon Moore and uh, just, just make a line. <laughs> and so you see that the future is bright so, uh, for spin qubits. All right, so, so maybe just be because we've heard about quantum error correction in superconducting qubits, there are also first steps towards quantum error correction for spin qubits. There's another experiment from the uh, Tarucha group in Tokyo, uh, which pr demonstrates a small, very small repetition code for uh, with silicon spin qubits. Um, it's a three qubit repetition code, and it corrects phase flips, which is the dominant error channel for uh, these types of qubits. However, the noise here was produced artificially, so it's not really correcting actual natural noise. So I don't know how much time I have. I, okay, I will, I will just very briefly tell you what, what's, uh, what's coming next. Um, so one of the problems is that we don't really have good non-local non two-qubit gates yet. Um, so if you look at these quantum circuits, of course, you can draw a C0 between any two qubits. They don't have to be nearest neighbor, but I told you this interaction is nearest neighbor. So that's one problem, right? So we have to think about coupling remote qubits. And there are definitely I mean, many ways to do that. One is to use exchange itself. I mean, of course, you can use it to make swap gates, and you just swap through. Um, the question is, is that really high fidelity? I don't know. Uh, you can shuttle, so you can physically transport electrons across many uh, quantum dots, and there are also several ways of doing that. We actually, there's a, a German uh, BMBF sponsored project to do this, and uh, in Infineon is actually also involved in this. And so this is, uh, this is one way you can shuttle over, over intermediate distances. And then what's really interesting, I think, is that you combine superconducting and semiconducting technologies to make to put these spin qubits into superconducting microwave resonators that can couple your qubits over very long distances. And so that's one topic that we've worked on uh, uh, quite a bit in my, in my group. So you're combining these two, the nice properties of both worlds to make uh, hybrid quantum systems uh, that have both superconducting and semiconducting uh, elements. And so how do you couple this uh, spin qubits? So uh, it actually depends which spin qubit what I've talked to you about. So this is a little chart where you have the number of electrons and the number of quantum dots. Just a single spin one half a qubit is nice, but it doesn't have an electric dipole. So uh, then uh, there are other ideas to use single triplet qubits in double dots. This is quite old. Or what I've showed you is this flopping mode qubit where you have two dots and one electron, and this has an electric dipole if you put it into a field gradient. This is actually what people are using to couple to a, the electric field of a microwave resonator. And so these are just a few experimental examples from, from different groups. Um, and so the way this works is uh, just briefly summarize. So basically, if you do the theory of this, what you find is that the coupling of the spin, so this is the coupling of the in, in terms of cavity QED, the coupling of the spin to the, to the resonator uh, photons this is proportional to the coupling of the charge degree of freedom, left, right, degree of freedom in the double quantum dot uh, to the photons. And it uh, also depends on the magnetic field gradient, this Bx here, and the, some kind of resonance condition. It, so this is the Zeeman splitting and the qubit splitting here. And so this can be a small number, the spin charge mixing angle. 
And the decoherence also scales with this, so that you inherit some decoherence from the charge qubit, and this goes like the square of this number. And so now if you choose this number small, then this, you can use the spin charge coupling to couple your spin to the electric field of the resonator without making too much decoherence. And so that's the idea. So this is kind of a, a, this is a theory um, prediction, what you would see in the transmission of such a resonator. And this is a, uh, an experiment from the Theta group again. And so this is this vacuum Rabi splitting you see from putting the spin qubit into the resonator. And this is this trick with the decoherence and the coupling. And finally, it is allows you to go to the strong coupling regime of, of cavity QED. And so with this, we can, we can um, just click through this here. So we are now, in, on the theory side, we are thinking about coupling two electron spins uh, in this way over a long distance through such a, a, um, a resonator. And this is just a, the recent development. There are now ex first experiments where these couplings are seen, and people are working on really coupling spin qubits over long distances. OK, um, maybe I'll go through this. So there are also, uh, cavity QED can also be used to characterize qubit noise. Um, so that's maybe another application, which I will not uh, talk about here because I'm out of time. So, so if, if I should answer, can we make this quantum? Of course, I don't know. But we should, uh, we should try. It's probably worth it. Uh, it's also interesting from a physics perspective. And I'm not the only one. So there, there's a whole a community. This is from last year's Spin Qubit 5 co uh, conference in, in Pontresina. This is a, a fraction of the spin qubit community. Um, it's getting larger as we speak. And there are many, of course, many challenges we have to address. But the main one is scaling, because a few qubits is not, is not good enough. So we, know, we also need to understand noise. Uh, we need to make these high fidelity non-local gates. And we should also work on encoded qubits. So I want to end by first acknowledge all the people in my group and also our collaborators from Princeton. They just moved to UCLA and, of course, also our funding. And then I cannot resist finally to advertise shamelessly our new reviews of modern physics article on spin qubits. So if you like this uh, and if you want to know more, this is just fresh off the press uh, and you can read all about it. So thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Guido, for the great progress in spin qubits. Uh, we have time for one or two short questions. Hi, thanks for the nice talk. Um, there's been some progress recently in kind of dramatically increasing the coherence times in MBE-grown optically active quantum dots in 3.5 materials by like cooling the nuclear spin bath. Is there any thought of revisiting 3.5s? There, would there be any benefit of that for uh, gate-defined qubits? Um, so 3.5s, uh, I, I think, s f first of all, I think some people are still working on 3.5s, um, both, the, of course, the, the electrostatically uh, defined dots and the, the optical dots are, of course, great for, for as an interface for, for optics. Um, that's, that's for sure. For, for these quantum computers, this is not so active anymore. I mean, people have tried this um, dynamical nuclear spin polarization. Uh, this also works in gate-defined dots to some extent. But it's, it's hard. So I think um, at the moment, I don't think, I actually have a bet with Ronald Hansen that by, I don't know, 2050, we'll have 100 gallium arsenide based spin qubits. So I, this was my stupidity when I was betting with him. He knew that silicon will win. So, so I think, yeah, I think for computing, probably this group four um, semiconductors will win. But for as interfaces with optics, I think three fives are still great. Yeah, so super nice talk, Peter. I have a question regarding your control via this synthetic uh, spin-orbit coupling. So you're using basically a magnet there, and do you have an estimate or kind of a gut feeling about the induced noise because the magnet will fluctuate at some point or to some extent and limit your performance? Is yeah, there so be this kind of ceiling? So I think the biggest problem is not, I mean, the, the, it's good, a good question about the, mag the noise of the magnet. I actually, done, I don't think this has been seen yet. But the, the biggest problem is, of course, that if you, um, if you have this gradient field on, it means that, and you also have electric noise, it means that now you've coupled the spin to the charge to some extent, and the spin will also suffer from electric noise. That's the main problem. 
And what saves us to some extent here is this flopping mode qubit idea that you can sort of switch off the dipole of the, of the spin qubit or to a large extent. Um, and yes, yeah, so this is, uh, this is the main issue. And then of course the question is, can we reduce charge noise? So some of the problems I think are actually also similar to what people are thinking about in the superconducting qubit world about these charge traps in the environment and the oxides, and I think these are, again, materials issues. But I, I don't think it's the, ma the magnets that create the main problem at the moment. Okay, I would recommend uh, please discuss this issue further in the coffee break because we are already over time. Guido, thank you very much again. And Thanks. again, enjoy the beer. Thank you. A very brief announcement.